So um, we decided to take what we know about how plants grow, how cows digest them, and what effects the environment has on that, and model a simulation of what would happen with the predicted climate change in relation to forages that are traditionally used in northeast dairy farms. We used, anim um, we used amts.cattle.professional, which is a commercial implementation of the CNCPS, which was developed here at Cornell, with its origins back in the late 1970s, and the research on that continues through today. This, this slide has, uh, or a slide like this, has gotten a lot of play at this particular conference. This shows what our historical trend has been in temperatures. This particular slide takes 1961 as a base, but as you can see, climate, land, and ocean temperatures have increased. This is a kind of, this has been a depressing, um, <laughs> depressing, <laughs> depressing conference because this, this actually gives us our, and I hate summer weather like this. I'm looking at his charts and seeing Tillamook and remembering, I like Tillamook. <laughs> I could live to, in Tillamook. So this shows um, what, what various temperature increases are predicted based on how, many, how much CO, CO2 emissions are, are continued through the end of the century. So this red line gives us the highest predicted temperature conditions and this orange line is if we held constant at the 2,000 CO2 emissions, which probably is not going to happen. So we're looking at temperatures somewhere in this range, which is a prediction of two to six degrees increase in Celsius through the end of the century. So that puts us, for North America, in the getting warmer zone, which I do not like. We also are looking at chain, predicted changes in moisture levels. This chart illustrates that it varies by region, the blue being getting more frequent and more intense um, moisture events like hurricanes, floods, tornadoes, and blizzards, and the red indicating that it's going to be drier. I'm a little grateful we're not falling in the red, but we're falling in the blue, as is shown by this predictive slide. These all come from the um, Intergovernmental Panel on climate, um, climate Change, and that's where a lot of these data is being pulled together for predicting climate, future climate change. So we're looking at a more frequent and more severe incidences of, of wetter weather. It doesn't mean we're going to be constantly moist. It's going to be um, events like we had this, this past spring which means we may see more fields that have flooding conditions where the, the, and I'm going to talk specifically about corn silage, where the corn is stressed. It can't run away and seek higher ground, so it's forced to, to um, utilize its ability to fight off these stressors. We also are going to see more fields that are, are droughty like this. Um, in the Northeast, we were more inclined to have the flooded fields. In other areas of the country, they saw more incidences of drought. All these are stressors on the plant, which will respond accordingly. This particular um, slide illustrates the different effects of things like sunshine, water, temperature, and fertilizer on plant development. In the case of increased temperature, it will cause the plant to grow faster and, and um, put, more, put more of its, its resources into lignification at a quicker development, at a quicker pace. Water will also create a greater lignification effect. The lignification bears directly, wasn't supposed to do that, bears directly on dry mat, on um, NDF, which is the dry matter which affects digestibility. Um, in this slide, explaining a little bit about that lignification and cross-linking that occurs in flooding situations. As with this tall building structure, you get the cross-linkages that are esterified bonds 
that cannot be digested by um, rumen microflora. So these are what are girding the plant and making it so that it's less digestible to the cow. This is research in the past digestibility was, was analyzed in terms of lignification. Recent studies done primarily here at Cornell have given us different ways of looking at the digestibility of plants. In this corn silage example, it breaks out the digestibilities in a fast pool, which is this blue line that's readily available to the cow, the slow pool digestibility, which is this green line, and that is, well, sort of chartreuse. Um, and that is more rumination and ballast. And then this, this darker green line, which is UNDF, which I'll be talking about primarily. The UNDF is not digestible by the cow. It's also called ANDF 240. Um, it's, it is that steady line of, of NDF that only can move out of the rumen through passage. If we look at this slide where we have the two different um, UNDF levels in a low UNDF corn silage and a high UNDF corn silage, we can see that, and I'm not sure, I just have to say I have some I had some modification to my slide set that may not have been incorporated in this iteration, so we'll see if the animation occurs, and it doesn't. So <laughs> anyway, um, if you look at this area underneath the curve, on this lower UNDF forage or corn silage, this area is what is not available to the cow to digest, so therefore this part of the curve is what's available for her to extract her nutrients and to make milk off of. In this higher UNDF diet, or higher UNDF corn silage, you see that this area that is available for digestion is much smaller. It would have been great if my animation was there. <laughs> so we're looking at a cow with a rumen, and she has a very, it is a finite size rumen. It'll grow some, it'll grow not, but she has a finite volume in which she can put forages. Studies done recently at, um, this is studies that go back into work that Van Seuss did as well as in some Nordic countries, but also a study between Cornell Minor Institute and the University of Bologna indicate that UNDF is very highly correlated to, to intake. So in a Holstein cow, which, so it's linked to body size, in a Holstein cow, that correlation seems to break out around 2,000 to 2,500 grams per day that she can take in. She can only take in more feed if she's able to eliminate some UNDF through passage. We did a very simplistic look at how increasing temperatures, or in our case, we're talking mostly about water levels, how that affects the digestibility and availability to a cow. A compounding factor that um, was just spoke about was that dry matter intake decreases as temperature increases. And as um, in the case of the CNCPS model, it uses the effective temperature index, which does take into effect solar radiation and wind speed in addition to temperature and humidity. And you can see a, a, an almost perfect correlation with decreasing temperature and decrease, or increasing temperature and decreasing dry matter intake. But we didn't study that. We kept our cow, we kept our study as simple as possible and only looked at one parameter. What we did was we took corn silage data from a commercial lab, and this data was collected over a period of three years, 100 samples. Statistically, there was no difference between the years, so we were able to treat that all as one data set. Um, we then looked at the 30, the 120, and the 240 DNDF values. Now that correlates to our fast pool, our slow pool, and our undigestible pool. Um, UNDF and DNDF 240 are the same things in the reverse. <laughs> so if you just looking at this chart explains it a little bit better. 
if you look at the 240 UNDF value, and the UNDF value, it's, it's simple math that even I can do it when under stress. Um, we were able to take those corn silage samples and break them into three different categories, a low UNDF corn silage, an average UNDF corn silage, and a high UNDF corn silage. The high UNDF corn silage is what we're predicting would be more typical of the corn silages that we would be seeing in the Northeast with predicted climate change. The low UNDF corn silage is more typical of perhaps a BMR corn silage. Um, this, this particular slide set doesn't give you how many samples we used, but 300 samples and it was broke out. So. Before our animal, we took a, and sorry that this is all in metric, um, we took a 700 kilogram body weight dairy cow who would attain a 750 kilogram mature weight. So she had a little bit of growing to do. That gave us 125 grams per day average daily gain. The model is able to capture the differences between what she would be as a mature cow and what she, what she needs to do for gain to, to um, partition her maintenance requirements. She is in a, in a no stress environment. So again, we didn't take into consideration what the heat stress that she would be under in this higher, um, higher temperature future what she would be under, we kept her at no stress to keep our, our analysis simple. She has a typical walking distance or activity level of a 500 cow dairy, or 500 cow six row freestall, and her milk fat is 3.5, true protein at 3.0. We then created a formulation that would vary our UNDF values. So we held all of the diets with a constant um, level of minerals, soy hulls, ground corn, canola meal, bypass soy, and alfalfa silage. We varied the corn silage inclusion depending upon the UNDF value of that corn silage to limit her intake to that 200 to 250 maximum that she can take in a day. So in the low UNDF diet or the, the more digestible corn silage, she's getting 12 kilograms of corn silage. Average, she's getting seven kilograms of corn silage. And the high UN death diet, she's getting 5.5 kilograms of corn silage. The results from that would be as you would expect. She's, her milk production on that higher, the, the better corn silage with the low UNDF is higher. And that, that is reflected because she's getting the dry matter intake is a more balanced dry matter intake. She's meeting her nutritional needs and protein and, or more closely meeting her protein and her energy needs. Her diet crude protein is a nice 15%. With the high UNDF diet, because she has less ability to have um, an adequate dry matter intake to meet her energy needs, it drives the protein of the diet up because remember we kept the other ingredients stable, we just varied it based on the corn silage UNDF. This is an examination of what we could expect in emissions and excretions. And it's always a hard matter to discuss if you look at it purely in terms of units. But if you look at it on a term of productive units, it makes the discussion quite different. When looking at this just in terms of units of fecal nitrogen, we have more fecal nitrogen in the, hot, the higher quality course, corn silage or the low UNDF corn silage. However, if you put that against the increased milk production that we're seeing in that cow that's eating a better quality diet, we have a lower um, fecal nitrogen grams per kilogram of milk. Urinary nitrogen is a little bit different because if you remember, the crude protein on that high UNDF diet was greater because the corn silage was offsetting it less. She's energy challenged, so in all likelihood, she has excessive nitrogen in her diet and she's excreting it in the form of, of urine. So the urinary nitrogen to milk productive nitrogen in that case looks good, as does the, the total excretions. 
um, the productive nitrogen to total nitrogen. When we look at these, and we often speak in terms of efficiencies, the theoretical efficiency in grams per gram of productive nitrogen and productive nitrogen is meat, milk, and pregnancy to total nitrogen is theoretical maximum is about 0.40 or 40%. In this case, with our low UNDF diet, we're seeing a very good efficiency, measure of efficiency. The high UNDF diet and the average UNDF diet are what we're actually seeing routinely out on the farms now in the Northeast. In terms of methane emissions, as for, um, again, because of the higher dry matter intake, we have a greater methane emission on the low UNDF diet, but when put in terms of productivity, it, it again comes to the low UNDF diet is, is a better measure of less methane production to, um, to milk production. It's the um, efficiency of, of maintenance that, or it's, it's that spreading of maintenance theory that Bauman also discussed when he was initially introducing the use of RBST. This is looking at the mass balance of the farm. So in terms of what we would be looking at for, again, the, contrasting the low UNDF diet primarily with the high UNDF diet, because her corn silage inclusion is lower due to the higher fiber rates, we actually need less land to feed 100 cows or to produce the corn silage that she would need during the course of the year. This, um, this is a problem in terms of trying to manage, our, we're always trying to manage on the farm how much nitrogen we have flowing out and how much nitrogen we're producing. So we have the same 100 cows excreting the same, excreting very similar amounts of nitrogen, yet we have less land on which to, to spread that manure. And this is assuming that we're primarily spreading manure on corn silage ground um, which is not entirely fair, but somewhat typical in a corn silage alfalfa rotation. To put that in more succinct term, and by the way, I love his graphics. I need his clip art. Um, <laughs> when we're thinking that we still are going to, we need to feed 7.3 billion people. As of, I looked at the world population counter this afternoon, and it's amazing to watch it go. It's it's picking up more people faster than a second, and people aren't dying quite as quickly. Um, so we still need to three, feed 7.3 billion people. It comes back to efficiency. Um, for making the same amount of milk production on a high UNDF diet, which is what we potentially could look at in the future with stressors to our, our crops, we would need a half more cow per unit. So for every two cows that are producing this amount of milk on a low UNDF diet, we would need three cows. And those three cows, even though they're eating a little bit less, they have significantly more manure than the two cows. So for conclusion, I think that we can all um, agree that it's going to be a warmer future. And in likelihood, it's going to be wetter with more severe climactic events flooding and things that will cause the, um, so the warmer temperatures increase the metabolic processes that increases lignification in forages. The excessive moisture increases the cross-linking, effectively reducing digestibility of forages. Fiber digestibility directly impacts dry matter intake animal performance. If she doesn't have the groceries, she's not going to make the product. Urinary nitrogen excretion, if she has excess protein and compared to her, her, her energy, she's going to um, excrete it out in the urine. And enteric methane emissions will be increased at per unit of production. It's not all bad because we have smart people in this room and smart people in in universities all over that are able to come up with devise strategies that will help us mitigate some of the concern coming with climate change. 
plant breeders, agronomists, and economists, and ruminant nutritionists have to work closely together. We have very sharp tools in our toolbox that will help us closely model what our for as as forage analysis improve as our understanding of how cows utilize forages improve, we can closely and precisely model what we're feeding the dairy cows so that we can more efficiently produce off the, the forages that we have to work with. We can also work to develop more low UNDF forages in response to climate change, like BMR corn, which does have some challenges. We can invent products and processes, and work is going on this right now, that will break the esterified linkages and allow the rumen microbes to be able to digest them. And we can also develop agronomic practices that minimize UNDF development. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions?